Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. We thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity of this day, for thy anointing, for you allowing us to be a part of your family and to teach us, lead us, guide us, direct us. And we give you our cups truly do run over, Father, and we give you all glory, honor, and praise. Not just on one day a year where people set aside a day for Thanksgiving. We give you thanks every day, and we thank you for it. And we pray, dear Lord, for, for those unspoken prayers before you at this time. You know every heart, every need, every wish, every dream, every concern. And we thank you for not only hearing these prayers, but we thank you for answering them in perfect season. And we also pray for that dishwasher to be off very soon. <laughs> and we pray, dear Lord, for special requests for June, Dana, and Jody, uh, for Kim, Lisa, and Joe. On all these, dear Lord, we ask that you lead that you guide, that you direct, that you touch, and that you heal. In Yahshua's precious holy name we pray. And we pray, dear Lord, always for all those who have come and gone from our chapel, that you watch over them. And we pray that they have not forsaken thy word, and they will return to the sheepfold soon. And we pray always, Father, for Israel and for our nation, for thy kingdom to come knowing that it will be thy will that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, to which we say, Come, Lord, come. And we pray for those first responders every day they are on the front lines, helping your children. And we pray for their safety, as well as our military who are in arm's way, or who are about to go into arm's way. We pray, dear Lord, and long for the days that their, their weapons will be replaced with the plows and as always father we pray for the lost those that do not receive truth this day now father I pray that you open up our eyes that we may see I pray that you open up our ears that we may hear thy words as it is written as it will be you that speaks to us this day in Yeshua's name we pray amen Okay, getting back into our Father's Word, today we are starting chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians. And really, we, we had, Paul's been discussing with us, through the Spirit of Christ, about being separate. Separate from what? Separate from this world. Separate from the, the, the thoughts of the way this world thinks. And he's, he showed us in other places where where we are to be peculiar, we're looked at as the from the world as peculiar people. Why are we peculiar to them? Because we don't think the way they do. We don't act the way they do. We don't we don't uh, perform the way they do. And it's not to say that everyone that does not walk with Christ is um, one that cannot do their job correctly. But let's face reality, if, if a person who, who has rejected Christ, rejected in all the good things that our Father brings forth in his word and shows us that if you live a righteous life, and what does a righteous life mean? A lot of people think you can't live a righteous life. I disagree with that. What righteousness means is that you're doing what's right according to God. And that even means that when you fail, and we all fail, that you repent. And you try very not hard not to go back to doing those sinful negative things, that you, or thinking even of those things that you once were doing. I know I've mentioned before that uh, a negative thought really isn't a sin. The sin comes from you acting upon that thought. Well, that's true. However, uh, it can be a sin and a thought if you dwell on it, if you allow it to become uh, a part of your uh, thinking process and you dwell on certain things. Uh, you've heard me say this many times, you are what you eat. 
And, and what that also means is that you are what you're thinking about, what you want to be. And that's what it comes down to, really, in life, is what do you truly want? Well, do you want to do what's right? Do you want to live with the Lord? Do you want to, to be that person that God can say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant? Or do you want the world to, uh, to be a part of the world and, and all its shortcomings? That's what it comes down to. So this is Paul teaching us many things along that area. So with that being said, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, with wisdom from our Heavenly Father, and it reads, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, what promises? The promises of, well, just like what we covered last week about the knowledge and understanding of us being the temple of God. The, the promises of what would happen to us being a child of God and what would happen to us rejecting Christ. So, therefore, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now let's break this down a little bit because it's important. It says, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. How, how do you cleanse yourself from filthiness of the flesh? Well, what is filthiness unto God? Sin. Well, how do you cleanse yourself from the filthiness of sin in the flesh? By repentance. And that doesn't mean just saying you're sorry, Lord. That means that you, you realize that <clears throat> what you are performing or thinking or doing, whatever the case may be, is a sin against our Father and His ways, His laws. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you repent of that, meaning that you have a change of heart, change of mind, to the point where you don't go back and continuously do those things day in and day out. And when you do fail, again, you repent, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> and you try very hard not to do that sin or sins again. But notice, it doesn't just say the flesh, does it? It says, and spirit. Well, how, how do you cleanse your spirit. It's the same way. Huh? Yeah, it's the same exact way. It doesn't matter whether it's the flesh or the spirit. The spirit really in, in, in this tense is more deep inside, more of your thought processes. Your, 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 some people call it your conscience, but it's not your conscience, it's your spirit within you. If you believe in the Holy Spirit, you better believe in evil spirits. Because I can assure you, evil can enter in a person who is unaware, who is not prepared for it, who doesn't have the full gospel armor on. What is uh, uh, Ephesians 6, I believe, if you don't know about the full gospel armor of God. That we must be wearing this at all times, 24-7. What does that mean even when I'm sleeping? Absolutely. 24-7 means 24-7. You never allow Satan a foothold in your life to cause disruption. The number one thing Satan wants to do in your life is to remove you from the Lord. Remove you from studying His Word. Remove you from praying. Remove you from dwelling upon the Lord and and trying to do what is right. And if he can accomplish this, he has won the battle. Not the war, but he has won the battle within your spirit. But it also says here, perfecting holiness in the fear or reverence of God. What does that mean, perfecting holiness? It means that you can do it. But you got to work at it. It's something... You didn't learn how to sin overnight. 
you're not going to be able to perfect holiness overnight. It's, it's something that you must do. Well, what are the things that you, you have to do to perfect holiness? Number one is just like in the AA uh, programs and stuff, you got to understand that you have a problem if you're a sinner. And you've got to understand that you've got to get rid of that sin. That's step one. You have to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And, and, and then uh, study His Word. Not read it. Study it to show thyself approved. That means that if there's something that you're reading that you don't understand, you do a word search on it, such as with a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance or the Companion Bible, Bullinger Companion Bible, or the Smith's Bible Dictionary. These tools have been given to us to help us search out the um, ancient meanings of some of these words. Our Father wants you to understand. Now, some people say, well, I don't need anything else. All I need is my Bible. Well, that's great. And that is true. All one truly needs is the Word of God. However, if there's some, I'm talking about those who you're, you're studying something and you just don't understand. Well, I'll go to my preacher. Well, what if your preacher is teaching false doctrine, such as flyaway doctrine, or, or Easter instead of Passover? See, not all preachers come from the same mold. Some preachers, believe it or not, are actually uh, divining things uh, from Satan behind the pulpits. I know that may offend some preachers, but so be it. If you're not teaching truth, what are you teaching? So perfecting holiness and the reverence or fear of God means that, that in your life you are day by day, moment by moment, second by second if it need be, perfecting the holiness of God's word within you. So he says in verse 2, receive us. We have wronged no man. In other words, receive the teaching. Receive the truth that we're bringing forth. What was the truth Paul and all the apostles were bringing forth? It was the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. And what you as a person needed to do. Well, there he goes talking about works. Yes. Yes. You have to do something. Number one, you've got to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Believe it or not, that's a work on your part. You need to roll up your sleeves and study the word of God. Believe it or not, that's a work on your part. Now, what are the wages of all that work? The wages is eternal life. Now, you don't pay for it. You can't buy it. Christ bought it. He paid the price on that cross. So it's free to you. Yes. But there's certain things that you must do to receive it. Yes. But if. If. <clears throat> if what? If you do the things. Yes. Like you just said. You no, know, some people say, well, that's works. Well, if you want to call it works, call it works. Okay, but you can't work to achieve the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God comes through Jesus Christ, and he did the work. He paid the price so that you freely, let's not forget, he paid the price. So there was a price paid. There was a work done, and he did that work for you. And for me. But he also wants you to work at perfecting with clarity what you need to know and to do as a Christian. So that you can not only live a better life, but you can have eternal life as well. So receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. We didn't lie, cheat, and steal in, in the word to try to bring you to the Gospels. Now you say, well, nobody does that. Oh, yes, they do, beloved. There's a lot of people today and have since all the way back in Paul's days have, have lied, cheated, and done all kinds of negative things to bring people what they thought was to the word. But if you're not following the teachings of the word of Jesus Christ, the word of our Father, you are not receiving the fullness of the gospel. You are not bringing forth that fullness of the gospel, which can only come by the Holy Spirit. 
And again, there's many people today who believe that they're following the Holy Spirit. But again, I tell you, if you believe in the Holy Spirit, you better believe there's an evil spirit in the world. And that evil spirit is very much in control of this world today. That's why they, the Word tells us that we are in the world but not of the world. We don't follow the way the world follows the Bible. We don't. The world wants to pick and choose what they want to follow in the Word of God. If they don't like it, they'll throw it out. And they'll change. Uh, I did um, a word search on something the other day. Uh, and I went to all these different Bibles. Um, I can't remember what that was. Um, but... Um, it doesn't matter. The, the, the fact of the matter is, I was reading all these different commentaries and all these different translations of this particular subject matter, and they were all over the place. And they had completely negated the truth of the matter. I found it in the King James, and I found it in the Hebrew text, but all these other translations, the New Living Translation and this and that and the other, had changed the word of oh, uh, Ezekiel 13:20 is what I was looking up, and where God says He is against those who teach His children to fly to save their soul. Well, guess what? All those uh, other Bibles took out fly to save their soul. They used birds. They put birds in there. It has nothing to do with their souls, but they changed it to birds. You say, well, what's wrong with that? It's false doctrine. You say, well, how could it be false doctrine if it's in the Bible? You told me that it doesn't matter what Bible I read. As long as I, I go and, and, and give it to the Lord and ask Him to reveal, here's the point. He will reveal that to you. That that is, if you're reading about birds, that it is false doctrine. You, you'll feel uneasy about it. That's why you should always pray to your Father. He's the author and the finisher of your faith. He's the author, no matter who scribed, who scribed all this down? He is the author of this book. So keep that in mind. And rely on him to lead, guide, and direct you. And then you will be perfected. So Paul says, we haven't defrauded no man. Three. I speak not this to condemn you. For I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Meaning that no matter what you go through, whether it be tribulation, whether it be singing hymns and praising and doing praise worship, we are with you. As long as you are perfecting along the way, as long as you are studying along the way, the clarity in which we brought forth the gospel. Listen, verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. Now this actually says pride. It's not the kind of pride that, that Satan had in the uh, first heaven earth age where he became prideful and instead of wanting to uh, be the one to guard the mercy seat, he wanted to be the one sitting upon it. In other words, he wanted to be the Christ. It was self. That was self-pride. This is a pride that you have. It's like a parent over its child like learning how to walk or learning how to talk or learning how to do a, a task that was very difficult for them. But it would be Eli Joy. In it could be. Mm -hmm. could be. So great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. He's saying, look, at the time he was going through tribulation. He was going through, through trials and, 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 and difficulties. But he had joy in his heart over uh, hearing about those that are doing what is right. He said, well, wait a minute now. What about his first letter? He's pretty kind of getting on the Corinth about some of the things that they were not doing or that they had failed upon. This is true. However, when Titus came and brought information to Paul about the, the blessings that 
came forth of, of them learning and repenting and learning that their old ways wasn't the right way, that God's way was the best way, he can now rejoice even though he is in tribulation. Five, four. When we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings. Within were fears. Well, well you say, well, what did they, what did they fear? Well, the unknown. I mean. Isn't, isn't that what most people fear, is the unknown? You say, well, 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 Paul knew. Paul knew that certain things were going to happen because he was following Christ. This is true. But let's not forget about the flesh part in the equation. The flesh, at times, will put you down a path of being fearful. Even though as a Christian you know that you shouldn't be fearful. That with God and through God and by God you can do all things. However, when the flesh intervenes, that you, you put yourself in a situation where you become fearful. And, and again, why do you have that fear? Because you, you don't know really at that point thinking about it in the flesh of the outcome. But in the Spirit of God, you know the outcome. Because the outcome eternally, we're talking about future, is eternal. Uh, all, those, all those difficulties that one has, all the negatives, all the body problems, the cancers, the diabetes, all these things, means absolutely nothing in the kingdom of God. Because they don't exist there. So if you put your eyes and, and you, you, you get to perfecting holiness those negative thoughts of the flesh will be put aside. It's not that you won't receive them. Those, those fiery darts will come at you at any given moment, any given time of any given day. But once you perfect the holiness of Christianity, you can dismiss it and say, that's not who I am anymore. And, and you may even say, you know, it may come to that. You know, I, I may lose my life to cancer. I may lose a limb to whatever. But it doesn't matter because this is just temporary. This is all just temporary. The important thing is eternity. And you stay focused on that. Not on what's temporary in the world. But you stay focused on what's eternal. And this is where Paul's dealing with this. Verse 6. Nevertheless... God that cometh uh, comforteth those that are cast down or that are lowly comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now what does he mean? Well Titus came from Corinth to bring the good news of what they were accomplishing in Corinth to Paul in Macedonia. So, so just as God comforteth, God allows other people to comfort other people. Now, really, if you think about this, once you start perfecting the holiness of God in your life, you have a different venue. Meaning, instead of now you praying for comfort, you praying for certain things in your life to become better. Now you are comforting other people it's by the words of God. It's a different point of view. It is a different point of view. Why is it a different point of view? Because the holiness, the, the perfection of holiness has now entered in and you just look at things so differently. It's just like about people talk about dying. A person who has perfected this understanding, the holiness of God in their life, doesn't look at the word dying anymore. Because they realize and they understand, you're not going to die. 
You weren't created by God to die. Now granted, there is a moment in time after the millennial period if a person hasn't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ and they reject him and after a thousand years of teaching by God himself and they still reject him and Satan is loose for that short season at the end of the millennium, yes, they will die. They will be blotted out from existence. And that is the eternal death. But you say, well, why in the world would God do something like that? He's not doing it. They are doing it to themselves. Because he's given them every opportunity to overcome eternal death. He didn't create them to die. He created them to be a part of his family forever. And that's what he wants. You. He created you. Think about that. He, God, the eternal creator, created you. He thought of you, and guess what? He still thinks of you. He wants you to succeed. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to perfect yourself in the holiness. So I'm so sick and tired of people saying, well, I'm a sinner. And, and granted, it's just I guess it's like being an alcoholic and joining AA. Once you were an alcoholic and you gave away, stopped drinking alcohol, you still call yourself an alcoholic. Because if you go back to drinking, that's exactly what you're going to do. You're an alcoholic. I guess so. That, that's the way a lot of people look at being a sinner. That they say, well, I'm a sinner. But with the perfection of holiness, I'm saved by grace. I'm saved by his mercy. I have repented of my sins. Christ paid the price for those sins. Now what irks me is all these preachers out here that I keep hearing are saying, well, you don't have to ask for forgiveness. You're already forgiven by the blood of Jesus on the cross. That's saying you can go out and sin and be the most heathenest person on this planet and already be forgiven. That's false doctrine. It's false doctrine. If you, if you sin, you're going to have to pay. The word says the wages of sin is death. So if you, and if you continuously become an habitual sinner without repentance, you're going to die. But here, going back to where I was talking about in the first place, as a perfected um, um, a Christian, what's the terminology? Perfecting holiness. You learn to get rid of that sin and you don't go back there again. And, and you try very hard not to. But as long as we are in these flesh bodies, you're going to have an opportunity to sin again. But you don't have to. The choice is yours. That's what it comes down to. Beloved, you will do, it all comes down to this, you will do what you really want to do. That's what everybody does. Everybody does what they want to do. You, you got a lot of people saying, well, I, I got this job, I hate this job, so, so I'm not doing what I want. Yes, you are. I mean, if you don't want that job and it's so hateful to you, then go find something else. We're living in a day and age today, right now, in the economy the way it is. You can find a job if you want one. And you can find a halfway decent job with, with the way things are going now. So don't tell me you, you, you can't quit and find something that you enjoy doing. And I've said this all my life, that if you do a job that you enjoy doing, you'll never have to work a day in your life because you will enjoy being there. I mean, I've had those jobs where I hated Sundays. Why did I hate Sundays? Because I knew Monday I had to go back to that job. And I had to learn these things. I had to perfect this thinking in my life. And, and if you do these things according to God's ways, you will have, you will have a happy life. That doesn't mean you won't have difficulties, but you'll have joy in your life. You know, it just comes back to my thinking about recently I've started playing again, playing music. Well, it, it came to me just the other day. I hadn't talked to you about this, but it came to me the other day. Why, why am I getting so into playing again? It's because I have joy in my life. 
it, it's hard. Some people say, well, then play the blues. Well, I'm not a good blues player. You know, that's not my gift. But my gift is to make a joyful noise, and that's what I'm going to do to the best of my ability. But to do that, I have to have joy. And, and that's what singing does. It brings forth joy. Maybe not to other people, but it does to me. You know. So it says in verse... It depends on what you're singing. Well, yes, you could sing the, the, the dreads of, of death and destruction, but I still say to have a voice and to have that want to sing and to produce songs, um, meaning to write songs, mm -hmm. it's still you've got to have joy in your heart, of, joy of the Spirit of God, better said. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before in verse 3 that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. I did that. And I did verse 4. You're at the 7 now. Uh, five, six, boy, I fell behind, didn't mm -hmm. I? Verse 7. And not by his coming only, Jesus Christ coming, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted no, in you. No, talking about Titus, I think. Yeah. Not Jesus Christ. But, uh, excuse me, Titus. And not by his coming only, not by Titus' coming to Macedonia only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. Titus was comforted by those in Corinth. When he told us your earnest drive or desire, your m mourning, your fervent mind or warm affection toward me so that I rejoice the more. So Titus is bringing some really good news to Paul, isn't he? About And, and again, look at the way Paul had written to Corinth, not to all, but to, to uh, uh, a goodly part in Corinth of the way they were behaving for a while. They weren't doing according to the Word of God. They weren't following the laws that they were supposed to fall, uh, follow. So there was a difference. Now think about Paul laying out this letter and then sending it and then not knowing if it's going to be received properly. Some people can receive a letter like that and say, Oh, the heck with him. I want to do what I want to do when I want to do it. But he didn't receive this when Titus came back to give Paul the information about how they had converted, how they had repented, how had they had changed their philosophy about everything that, uh, from those negative things that they were once doing. So now Paul can rejoice even more because they are being obedient children to God's word. Uh, the word says, uh, I, I believe it's in John, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. You can say you love the Lord till the cows come home. But how do you show the Lord that you love him? By obeying and keeping his commandments. And uh, some people say, well, I, I do. Well, I beg to differ with the way some people are behaving that they are truly keeping all the commandments of God. But I'm not here to, to uh, judge. So verse 8 says, For though I made you sorry with a letter, that was that first letter, I do not repent. I'm not sorry that I sent that letter. Though I did repent, <laughs> meaning that I did regret that I had that uh, do that. Now, now, now think about this. When you talk to someone who's sinning and you're led to talk to them about their sin, didn't you yourself regret that you had to talk to them about it? Why? Not that it was wrong to talk to them about it, but you regret that it had to be talked about in the first place, meaning you regret that they're sinning. It pained you. It pained your spirit. It does pain your spirit. For I perceive that the same epistle 
hath made you sorry. The same letter hath made you sorry. Though it were but for a season. In other words, it was just for a short moment of time. And But you see, the point is, Paul sent it not with hate on his heart, with love on his heart. And let's not forget, Christ gave him those words to scribe down, to say, and even if another person such as Luke scribed it on, on pinned on paper or papyrus, and it was sent to them, it was still needed. That's the point. That Paul didn't say it because it was something that he wanted to get off his chest. He said it because the Spirit of God led him to bring forth this to those at Corinth. So now, because of that, what can he do in verse 9? He says, Now I rejoice. Not that ye were made sorry. I'm not... I'm not rejoicing because you felt bad about it, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. Isn't that the key? Every single time we talk to someone who is sinning, isn't the whole point that we're talking to them is that they come to repentance? That's the whole point. But if you're talking to them and just putting them down, or talking behind somebody's back and just putting them down, that's not bringing someone to repentance. Actually, that's bringing yourself into sin by gossiping. Think about that. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, or according to a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, that you wouldn't suffer loss, would not suffer loss by anything that we sent. In other words, you would gain, you would gain what? You would gain knowledge and wisdom in the spirit and, and the being perfecting righteousness in your body, which basically means getting rid of sin. Think of it this way. A person that is without sin doesn't need to repent. What do they need to repent for? Now, a person's going to say, automatically, I hear this all the time, well, that's not possible. Well, that's, not, that's saying Jesus never accomplished that. Oh, yeah, Jesus did, but nobody else. Really? What about Elijah? He was taking the kingdom. What about uh, uh, Zechariah? He, he was uh, found without blemish. You know, he was, he, was, he was found obeying all the commandments of God, him and his wife, and, and, and Enoch. I mean, there are, yes, far and few between, I, I'll give you that. But it is possible. It is. See, we've got to get this negative thinking connotation in our minds that, well, I'm going to sin. I'm, I'm in the flesh. I'm going to sin. Well, that may be, but once you repent of that sin, you're no longer a sinner. Now, if you go back to that sin again, guess what? I don't believe you truly repented. Because true repentance means not that you're just saying you're sorry, but that you don't go and do that sin again. That's true repentance. You say, well, how many times can one be forgiven? Well, that was uh, brought up to Christ, wasn't it? You know, well, Lord, how many times shall I forgive this man? You know, uh, seven times? He says, 70 times seven, which means you always forgive. But what does it mean to forgive someone? Well, don't they have to ask for forgiveness? Don't they have to say, well, I'm sorry? Now, some people say, no, they don't have to. I can forgive them no matter what, such as a person, God forbid, that, that that's... Uh, murdered somebody, murdered a child, and that parent says, well, I forgive them. Now, does that mean that they shouldn't be judged kind of forgiveness? No, the judgment will come not with man, but with our Father. However, what does that kind of forgiveness mean? It means that you're not going to carry the burden of hate in your heart about that person because that'll that'll burden you down 
if you hate a person. Now, granted, what they did was the worst of worst. And and they, they took a life, not only a life, but a, a life of, of one of your children. But the thing is, you can't forgive that person by allowing in your life to not carry around hate anymore for that person. That's the kind of forgiveness that the Lord is talking about there. But but to to forgive oneself is something that you must do as well. Um, different subject for a different time. Um, now I rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry, or or according to uh, suffer loss after a godly matter, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing, as what he wrote. For godly sorrow, hear this, verse 10, <clears throat> for godly sorrow worketh repentance. That's what I was just talking about. To salvation. Not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. What does that mean, the sorrow of the world? What do you think that means? What does that mean to you, the sorrow of the world? Worketh how, how death. The, how the, the world views people in situations. <clears throat> um, you, can, you can take the media, for example. How a certain person says or does something that somebody doesn't agree with or is wrong according to social standards they can basically beat them down in the dirt um, as far as their not godly standards no not godly standards <clears throat> they, they will they will talk, talk bad about them and, and it's not uplifting and edifying what they do Bas yes that's true and you know godly sorrow work of repentance to salvation not to be repented of in other words you don't have to repent of that uh, godly uh, sorrow but the sorrow of the world and the way the world looks at it you do need to repent of because it's not godly and if it's not godly what, what kind of repenting are you doing really you're repenting that maybe you didn't do more to that person mm -hmm. that did wrong to you see it's a whole different philosophy and thinking Verse 11, for behold, this self same thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. That's the way the world looks at these things. I want to get back at you more than what you gave me. In all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. In other words, you, you came to the conclusion, you came to that perfecting of holiness in your life, that true repentance leads one to perfecting holiness in your life. True repentance brings one to clarity of mind and spirit. And you see things for what they are, the reality of it is. And you don't look at it as the way the world looks at it anymore. You also don't respond to situations totally in an emotional state like you once did. You search your soul for what's right and what's wrong. Yeah. And which is a better way to go. Now, now look at the world. Well, let's not just take the world. We can because it's happening all over the world. But let's just take our own country. How so many people are so angrily, angry at each other. They're, and, they're, and they're told to go out and disrupt people's lives. You know, disrupt them in elevators, disrupt them in restaurants, and, 
and and then what happens to that disruption when it gets out in the streets? They start throwing bottles and 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 uh, rocks and grenades and all kinds of crazy shootings. I mean, look at all the shootings today. Excuse me. There, there's been all kinds of shootings in the past, but it's it's so rampant anymore. It's terrorism. It's not all terrorism, but it does bring terror. And in that form, I guess you could call it terrorism. But the point being is, what I, I, I want you to understand, it's the mindset of people. Why are supposedly good Christian folks behaving so badly? Well, number one is because they've been mistaught the Word of God. And number two, that, that uh, they've approved themselves for what they're doing is right. Well, you, if, if, if you're having perfecting of holiness in your life, you're not going to go out there and disrupt people's lives. That doesn't mean that you can't have a, 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 a judgment thought about what's right and what's wrong. And, and if you see a, a wrong, that you can't go out there and, and uh, in order... And with discipline and uh, strength of voice, tell someone or, or tell a government or tell a, an entity that what they're doing is wrong. But you do it God's way, not with hate. You do it as what Paul did. He wanted to perfect them. He wanted to encourage them. He wanted them to grow. Well, how can you have a person grow or an entity grow or a government grow if you're constantly bashing at them mm -hmm. and telling them how sick and deprived they are or throwing rocks at them? What, what is that going to achieve? You know, I mean, the only time in the old days that they threw rocks at anybody was to kill them. Stone them to death. But it was with two or three witnesses, but different subject for a different time. Verse 12, Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, that first letter, even this second letter, though I wrote, wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, nor for his cause, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. That's why I wrote to you. I didn't write to you to condemn somebody in the church. I wrote to you so you might have clarity. Well, let's take this a step farther. When we're dealing with people, general public, friends, family, whatever, and we're trying to lift them up, we're trying to bring the light of God's truth in, in their time of misery. If we don't do it with clarity, if we don't do it with God's way, God's way, we're not going to succeed. We may not even succeed doing it God's way. Because at that point, eventually, we let go and let God. It's up to God to to have that person grow or not to grow. And really it comes down to whether or not they want to grow or not. But the point being is how many times have we talked to someone on the phone who's going through all kinds of difficulties and, and, and some people will jump on their bandwagon. Say, well, yeah, you need to do this negative thing or that negative thing or that negative thing. Instead of being compassionate long-suffering, godly, and say, look, I believe this is what our Father teaches us in His Word of how we should behave during this kind of situation. Because and when negative's happening, don't we take it personal? I mean, if it's happening towards us, mm -hmm. we take it personal. Or to someone we love. Or to someone we love. Um... But the point is, our Father wants us to start looking at these things. Because they're going to happen. He wants us to start looking at these things through His eyes. And look at the long picture. Not the short picture. Look at the long-term aspects 
of what the outcome may bring forth or not bring forth. And we need to do that according to his word, which means what? The first thing you got to do is become knowledgeable of his word. How can you bring forth godly knowledge from his word if you don't know his word? If you just take for whatever so-and-so is saying to you about God's word, you need to find out what God is saying to you about his word, which means study to show that self-approved. Well, when should I study? Every day of your life. If you have an opportunity, every day of your life. You feed your face, feed your soul. Verse 13. Therefore we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joy we for the joy of Titus, the joy that Titus brought us, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. It tells us that they were all from the south. <laughs> I guess. But point being is that Titus brought this joy to Paul. And the reason he had this joy is because they refreshed Titus when he was with them. Now, the, Titus could have brought that first letter and, and uh, got into their faces about some of the negative things that were happening. And instead of them uh, repenting and rejoicing of that repentance, they could have been cam, become nasty kind of people. Mm -hmm. Saying, well, who, who is Paul to tell me this and that and the other? Or who is the Lord to tell me that, which I pray he never would have. But, you know, they, they could have gotten worse. And that's what happens in life at times. You know, a person who's being negative, a person who is sinning, and you talk to them about sin, at that point they're at a crossroads. They can either repent and, and go the right way, and become a righteous follower of the Word of God and repent and do those things that are right, or they can keep going left and jump in Satan's camp if they aren't there already. But again, the choice is theirs. But it, 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 it comes to mind where I talked to this man the other day. I was witnessing to him about um, his lifestyle. And for, for weeks if not months, I just kept silent about this lifestyle that he was in. But the point is, it was on my heart that what he was doing was sinful. And if I allowed that to continue, meaning if I allowed myself to continue to just keep my mouth shut, and I knew better and I didn't say anything, I would be held responsible. Yes, they would have to pay for their own sins, of course. But I too would have to pay for their sin, and I, I could I couldn't do that. And and the reason I bring this forward, if if you know a person in life that is just a sinful person, and you know what they're doing is wrong, with love on your heart, with the word of God in your mind, and prayer. Of course, prayer. You always start with prayer. You talk to that person. But again, with love, you're trying to lift them out. Not that you can do it, but God within you can. And you want the God that is within you to be the God that is within them. Isn't that what it's all about? I'm almost out of time. Let me continue. 14, for if I have boasted anything to him of you, Titus, about you, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed that I boast that, that you're doing good. But as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found in truth. In other words, I may be boasting, but the thing is, what I'm boasting about is them following the scripture, them following truth, them following repentance, and doing what is right, perfecting their holiness. That's what he's really boasting about. Verse 15, And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all. How with fear and trembling ye received him. You didn't receive him with hate on your heart. 
You didn't receive him with negative. You received him. You heard it. You gave him an opportunity to speak, to read the letter. How many people today will not receive? You come to them, if, if they're being negative in life, and they're, they're, they're acting shamefully, you come to them with love on your heart and the word of God, they just turn you away. But with, with that said, the Lord doesn't want us to be a Bible thumper either. Which means that in your heart, you know that that person, chances are they're not going to receive you. So you come in with kid gloves. You come in with love and, and, and kindness and, and, and truth. But when, you, when the word says truth, that means the word. It is the word that heals, not you, not me. It is the word that heals, if they're going to be healed at all. And finally, in verse 16, I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Now, that's a wonderful thought, that Paul has confidence in them. Well, when you're dealing with someone and you're trying to bring them to the knowledge of their sin, you need to have that boldness. You need to have that confidence that with God, all things are possible. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that they will instantly repent before your eyes. But what it does mean is that you planted a seed of truth. And it may be down the road that they truly remember that moment and do repent. To which we give God all Glory and credit. Yes. I just have a quick question. On 15, that fear and trembling, do we know if that is actual fear and trembling or is that love and... I said it was reverence. Reverence? Okay. Yeah. I didn't catch that. Sorry. Are there any other questions? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of this day. We thank you for your truth that you have brought forward to us. The truth of, of your word it means everything to us. We can over, overcome all obstacles on this planet and in, in, in the kingdom, your kingdom, where there are no obstacles, we will rejoice. But you give us an opportunity today to rejoice. Today we can rejoice in the knowledge and the wisdom that we can become holy, perfected by thy hand. And that we can overcome all obstacles. And we thank you for that knowledge, Father. And I pray all here will do this this day. Begin this journey, if they haven't already. I pray for everyone here today and all, all our families and all those on YouTube and all their families. That you watch over us, lead us, guide us, direct us. And forevermore give you all glory, honor, and praise. For we do love you with all our hearts, with all our minds all our strengths and with all our souls for it is in Yahshua's precious holy name we pray amen, amen. to God be the glory